chapter 10, verse 1 says, And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillar of fire. While the key focus of chapter 10 is the little book, the first thing John sees is the appearance of another mighty angel. This is important because the appearance and the character of the angel gives soundness and significance to the little book and its message. Some see this angel as Jesus because of the description given of the angel. He descends with a cloud, which there's cross reference Psalms 104, 3, Revelations 1, 7. His face is like the sun, cross reference 1 and 16. His feet are as pillar of fires, cross reference 1 and 15. Another is the Greek word alos and means another of the same kind. He is very likely the same angel which is in five two and this angel it's moving on its own it's not letting me click it <laughs> coming down then simply emphasizes his source and his authority the cloud clothed with a cloud the angel are ministering spirits sit out to minister or carry out God's purpose as with these judgments. In this, he makes or clothes them as he desires for the task at hand, cross-reference Hebrews 1, 7, and 14. The rainbow was upon his head. Since a rainbow is a sign of God's faithfulness to his word in scripture, the color rainbow teaches that his appearance and the message of chapter 10 are a result of God's faithfulness to his covenants and mercy. God was here in the process of fulfilling, go back, fulfilling Old and New Testament promises. Mm -hmm. The face was like sun, which stresses this glorious angel was invested with divine glory and holiness to show us he was acting in response to God's holiness. Cross-reference Exodus 34, 29. Feet like pillars of fire. This emphasizes his stance as firm, stable, and movable. Fire points to judgment and shows that God is unmovable in the outpouring of these judgments. Um, questions, comments, or statements? I don't have any questions, but I think that um, your explanation is really good. But I, I do see why it's moving. I, I, I think I know why it's moving on its own because I know you're using transitions and your transition has a time on each one of them. And- um, It's not supposed to, they do? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's something that you hit in the transition that calls it to move in and out. But it's okay, as long, long as you got control to move it back to where it's supposed to be if it's going ahead of you. But, um, but um, thus far, I don't have any questions, but, um, but it looks good. Okay. The little book and he had in his hand a little book which was open in distinction to the seven sealed book in christ's hand in revelation 5. this is a little book and it is open it was an open book which may indicate that it contained old and new testament prophecies of the coming events though the exact contents of this little book are not revealed in this chapter the point is this book had been opened prior to this chapter. Unlike the seven seal book that had its contents revealed gradually, seal by seal in the progression of the book of Revelation. Uh, 
and he placed his hand, his right foot on the sea and his left on the land. Evidently for emphasis, this is mentioned three times in this chapter, verse two, five and eight, and presents a picture of total conquest of land and sea. It is route and it relates this angel and the message of the little book to God's purpose and promise to take possession of the entire world as it will be carried out in the final events of this significant period of world events. Question, comments, or statements? Well, let me ask the question. Go ahead. The representation of the little book, is it similar to that of Ezekiel? Or are they different? When you say, is, there, is it similar to Ezekiel, what do you mean? I may be getting ahead of myself because I thought that in, in chapter 10, he told John to eat the scroll. Yes, he, he, he does tell John in the last part. It, 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 we sorry. will come to that. We will come yeah. to that. Okay. 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 We I'll will wait. come to that. I'll wait. <laughs> the seven thunders had uttered their voices. John, as was his custom with these visions, was about to write down what he heard. But a voice out of heaven, perhaps the Lord himself, forbids this action. It is sealed and is never revealed in this book. Hmm. The Lord will evidently explain and reveal this himself when we are with him. So this is something. God is revealing things, but this is not revealed. So this is something that maybe when we're all with him, that he will reveal this unto us himself. Wow, that would definitely make anybody wonder why, as you said, John has a routine and was given a routine to write down and here where he's prohibited to. Uh, mm -hmm. So that automatically um, makes one wonder why the norm is no longer uh, being allowed when you're, the norm was to write down and write down thoroughly to listen, to hear, to and see, but here too, but he's not, uh, wasn't able to record it. So it's, to me, it's not that John, and, it's, and correct me if I'm wrong, it wasn't that John didn't see what he saw. It just was, it wasn't so much not meant for John as it was not meant for us. Right, it wasn't meant for us. It was meant for John, but it wasn't meant for us. He is the only man that was allowed to know this. But, but you but said- But we that was. Funny. You said that it's going to be revealed in time, correct, by God himself? Right. Do you think that maybe, uh, this is just speculation, that it was the fact that it, for um, um, the church, which had already gone, uh, for those that are being redeemed, because this is really queer, there's been a lot of speculation, books written on it, that it was given but never revealed. Um, that, that is very strange. Well, this is something that, you know, God didn't allow him to pin it down. So this is something that he was not allowed to take back with him. So even though he heard it, saw it, it he was not allowed to record it. I also will go a step further that if God did not want it revealed unto us, only to John, I think it may be dangerous trying to speculate on it then. That's true. That's right. True. Just right. accept it. Right. Let's accept that this was something that was revealed only to John at that time. And that and later on, maybe when we're with the Lord, he'll reveal it to us then. Amen. And so you're but so I want to get this correct. Guys, I think you used term one term, he will, but I think you're meaning what you just said, maybe he will. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. So it's maybe he will. Right. Well, it was something that was uttered 
in God's presence, but God forbid him to reveal it unto us. The, the writers and everything that I've read, they all stated that it, it's something that the Lord will evidently reveal to all of us when we are in his presence. No, you, when you say writers, are you talking about commentators? Or are you talking about commentators? Um, everybody who studied Revelations and pinned down that I read their their writings, they all put the same thing that it was something that God would reveal to us when we're in His presence. Okay. Okay. They they didn't say it was just something for John. No, they all saw it as something that God would reveal later on to man. Okay. Then there's the oath. The mighty angel takes the position of oath in order to affirm the plan and purpose of God to take possess possession of the earth without further delay. The basis of the oath is the person and work of God as the eternal self-existing God who created all things by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and earth. That there should be no time, no longer. Verse six, time. Time is chronos which refers to a duration of time, time as period of time. Some see this as a declaration that time will be no more. When the seven angel sound, when the seventh angel sounds, then the mystery of God will be finished. And the majority say, it won't be so much that time will be no more. It's that there will be no more delay. Time will run out for everyone. Question, comment, or statement? Okay, very good. A lot of information so far. Amen. Well, sis, this is where we come into you, your part, which you were asking earlier. Okay. And then in this part, this is where John is told to eat the book. And in the sense of eating the book, eating is often a picture of learning and assimilating the word of God. Cross well, reference Ezekiel 9, um, 2, 9 through 10, 3, 1 through 4, and 14, and Jeremiah 15, 15 through 18. Undoubtedly, John was delighted with the fact of this revelation from God, which revealed that God will take over his kingdom and would defeat his enemies. But as he contemplated and reflected on the nature of this revelation, God's wrath, the revelation of the man of sin, Satan's kingdom, the worship of the beast, the persecution of Israel, the manifestation of man's heart, and the rebellion, etc. The message of the book became bitter in his stomach and it gave him spiritual heartburn. This is undoubtedly the content of the little book, much of which we have in the final portion of Revelation and perhaps also in the Old Testament prophecies, such as um, Daniel. And this is chapter 10. Okay. Amen. So um, when, uh, go ahead. When when he talk tells John to eat the scroll, eat the little bug. Mm -hmm. It was bitter and then it was sweet. Would this entail being about judgment and mercy? Would you think? Because part of it will be, you know, sweet and the other part is bitter. Because I'm, try I'm trying to figure out how him eating the book and Ezekiel, it, are they similar? Know what I mean? It, it is similar. 
because it even tells us um, in, in in the studies and everything I've read, it takes us back to um, cross reference in Ezekiel and and like said, they said in eating it, it's a learning and assimilating and taking in and um, but we are dealing with the judgment here. Okay. We are dealing with judgment here. Yeah, but none of none of your commentator mentioned this as I don't think even though this is dealing with judgment, John has nothing to do with judgment. I think his 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 uh his role is only to witness and to record. Uh, right. And, True. And, and, and He's that's learning. Pretty, yeah. Right. That that's pretty much it. Um. And I think we learn. So I think you learn that John um, ministry continued on way after this, and so I'm not sure what he relayed to others after this. But we do know that he had a mission. Maybe I, I don't want to go too far as far as that's concerned. But uh, I'm trying to address what Elder Pinkney was trying to make co the connection between Ezekiel and John. I really don't think there's no connection at all. I think the only connection is is that they both reference eating and and taking in. And most of the time, most uh, um, references will reference something, not that it has a connection, only that it it it, it details about the same thing. But the thoughts are probably two different thoughts and two different time periods that, that don't have any connection at all. Uh, when John is dealing with judgment the last days and Ezekiel, I, I will have to look up and see what Ezekiel was uh, okay. eating about. But there, I think the word eating, again, as uh, Pastor Ray brought out, does reference when God talks about eating the word or things of this nature, reference to take it all in, to to to, uh, to digest, a, to get a full understanding or full comprehension or, or to get a full revelation. But other than that, I don't think there is no, and I'm looking it up right now. Because okay, um, can I, I'd like to add something here. Yeah. Okay. Um, there, some of the reading that I've done does relate it, um, Ezekiel and John, um, as God confirming their prophetic role, um, mm -hmm. said that receiving God's word or the word of God can be a pleasant experience, but it often results in the unpleasant task of speaking judgment on evil. Mm -hmm. And you know, anytime you get to um, pointing out ills or evils or wrongdoings, um, you always will face um, some adversity because people like doing evil people like doing wrong and they don't want to um, be checked on it so when you're speaking god's word um prophetically it's not always received well so um but that was just something that i had read concerning the pleasantness or the lack thereof um some being bitter and, and some of it being sweet but it did reference um ezekiel and John as having a prophetic role. And I also, as I was studying, I, I, I concur with that. It also talks about how we look at, at the Bible uh, as prophecy, which is predictive and fulfillment, whereas the Jews did it masonically and they looked at patterns that occur. So they would look at the Old Testament today's, you know, and use different things to exemplify uh, types of Christ, uh, prophetic confirmation um, that it was God, et cetera. And so it's two ways of looking at the writings in the Bible and how they wrote and how it was understood. And so that kind of helped me to realize that it was just an example in the new of the old. Um, and so that's, that's how I kind of understand. I may be incorrect, but that's the way I look at it. Okay. Okay. Um... Yeah, I, I think I'm sure what you're saying, an example. I think many times our references, again, are examples uh, where both of these men were told to do the same thing, eat. Right. I think they've got two different messages out of it for two different time periods. Mm -hmm. And, but John definitely, and I like all they said about, I just read it. Um, it doesn't go into a whole lot of detail neither does uh ezekiel neither one goes into um well john gets more detail 
uh, and it looks like John eat after um, was he was able to write some things. It was just only one particular aspect that he wasn't supposed to write about. Am I correct right. on chapter 10? That's that one piece. Right. So he was able, so he also, so that, that eating, do you th take that to be literal or figurative? Let's start there. Is that literally eating or figuratively eating? I, I, I believe it's spiritual. Okay, figurative then. Okay, anyone else? Mm -hmm. Anybody think he literally ate something? No. 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 <laughs> Let's want to be clear. Just got to make sure. <laughs> I mean, uh, but now it also, I will say, reminds me of um, with the prophet Daniel, when he was told to seal up part of his vision that he had received too. He wasn't allowed to share everything um, that he had seen as well. And I believe Jeremiah uh, also was told to write, and I don't think that everything they wrote was was, was shared. And mm -hmm. I think that when you see these patterns, Elder Gwen was talking about patterns. When you see these patterns, that God, every time God shows you something, everything's not meant for you to reveal to everybody. Everybody's not in a place that you, they can receive what you receive. And I think that's crucial as a prophet not to force certain revelations on the church when the church is not in a place to receive it right now right true. And true. That's true. because sometimes um uh i forget what the prophet's name was he says some everything i'm saying is not for everyone in this house because some of you are not on the level to receive it right mm -hmm. and and i think sometimes also too sometimes what god has in store his plans I, for lack of a better word it, it's so magnanimous till you know the human mind can't even fathom and grasp it all and i think it would just be too overwhelming um you, you know and it needs to be rolled out in small bits and pieces <laughs> to, you know to, to really to keep people on track and not to deter you out of Oh my God, I'm overwhelmed. You know. Yeah. Yeah. And, and to me, it's all about timing as well. Right. That's right. True. Because sometimes you can give out information ahead of time. It may be right, mm -hmm. but yet and still, you giving that in your time and not in God's time. In and God's time, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And what, I'm what, thoroughly enjoying this. You, you cover, you're man, providing man. a lot of information here. Thank you. It is. And also, uh, piggyback on what uh, you guys are saying, too, uh, uh, revealing something before time. When some people know something before time, that they will uh, somehow try to not uh, unintentionally change the future. Right. right. You know, mm -hmm. and you Amen. know, I, I think it's dangerous for people to pray. Amen. You know, Amen. Show me who this is going to be in my life. Show me this mm -hmm. one. Now, mm -hmm. God, if mm -hmm. we knew everything, who's going to be in, in and out of our life, we would try to change that. We would try to right. change certain things. So sometimes God does not want us to know. And I think pro prophets have a lot of responsibility yeah. when it comes down to what and what not to reveal. You, you know, and it, one of my um, Sunday school lessons, we were talking about the fact that um you know when god tells you to go forth and do sometimes he you know he just says well go take this step right here and and wait um and it, it's because like if he gave you if, if he unrolled it and gave you everything at one time mm -hmm. you yeah. would see these pitfalls mm -hmm. you would see them because the enemy is setting you up to fail but you may not see the fact that god has already provided a Amen. way out or a covering Amen. of that pitfall so you won't you're not going to fall in it but if you saw it prior to it occurring it could cause you to turn and go back when god Amen. has told you to go forth and do Amen. right and even on a natural level mm -hmm. we can't as someone in the culture they do some phase Mm -hmm. Yeah. They don't just roll all at once. Right. They do things. Because we nosy. <laughs> 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 and we want, and we want it our way. <laughs> that, that's exactly that. Wow. We want man or yeah. do it. 
You, mm -hmm. you know, we live in a microwave yeah, mentality yeah, of society. Buddy. We want everything right now. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah. That's true. And get well, out Pastor, of the way. That's how we want it. That's so true. Okay, Pastor Wright, okay. You, Let's you get, let chapters. me get back. I got yes. two more chapters to do. Yeah. All right. Chapter 11. Main focus of chapter 11 are the two witnesses. And I will give power unto my two witnesses. What is given is not stated. The ideal, however, is that whatever is needed to fulfill their task, God will give it, such as protection, morale, authoritative and effective testimony, ultimate deliverance. They should prophesy a thousand and three score days, which is equal to three and a half years. The two witnesses will come on the, on the scene at the beginning of the great tribulation. The three and a half years will take us to the midpoint of the seven years of the tribulation period. Now the two witnesses, that's the big debate and uh, <laughs> Enoch and Elijah versus Moses and Elijah. Oh, now that's the one agreement everybody has that Elijah is in the team, but who's the other teammate? We go to Hebrews, it tells us in Hebrews 9, 20, 9 verse 27 that, and as it is appointed unto man wants to die, but after this, the judgment. I'm a, I'm now, a now, a few guys that I was reading that talked about the two witnesses, their justification for saying that it's Moses was because of Deuteronomy 18 and 15. The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from midst of thee and thy brethren, like unto me, unto him ye shall hearken. Matthew 17 and 10 to 12 states that, and his disciples asked them, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elias must first come? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias truly shall first come and restore all things. But I say unto you that Elias is come already, and they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they list. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. Now we know in this scripture that he is talking of Elias, but he is definitely talking of John because John came in the spirit of Elias. But also Elias must also come again. Now, the guys I studied and the commentators that I read, in regards to chapter 11, the powers to kill with fire from their mouths. Now, they brought up that Elijah and 2 Kings brought down fire from heaven and killed the captains, captains and their men. Mm -hmm. So, they associated the fire from the mouth with Elijah. Shut up heaven that it's rained not in the days of their prophecy. So they associated the shutting up the heavens um, with Elijah and the waters to turn them to blood and the smiting the earth with the plagues. They associated that with Moses because of what Moses and Aaron did in back in Egypt with the plagues and the turning the water into blood. So because their miracles are similar to those of Elijah and Moses, and because Malachi 4 and 5 says, Behold, I am going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Some believe one of these must be Elijah because scripture says Elijah will come again. Further, Moses and Elijah were seen with the Lord on the Mount of Transfiguration. So many believe and teach the two witnesses 
here are Elijah and Moses, who are given bodies and who are brought back to earth. Others have see them as Elijah and Enoch, who were translated and never saw death. Now we know in chapter 11 that, the, that these two witnesses will do these mighty works for God and that they will see death. And I, because of what I have read and what I've studied, I go so more, I lean towards the Elijah and the Enoch version versus the Moses and Elijah group. Question, comment, or statement? Why do you choose Enoch? Why do I choose Enoch? Because um, there is no other verse in the Bible that would associate Enoch coming back and experiencing death. So, well, I would also say, and that, God is not a man that he should lie. Well, Enoch had Enoch has not he's the only one of the ones that has not experienced death. Right. Well, is that true though? Did not um, from my um, setting uh, yeah. that um, Enoch and year, Elijah are the only two that haven't two. experienced death. Right. Didn't it's, they were they were seen and then they were seen no more. Right. What 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 about Moses? Moses is dead. Moses died. Yeah, Moses definitely died. Remember, they were fighting over his bones in the. Oh, that's mm -hmm. right. They were fighting over right. his. Yeah, bones. Satan wanted his bones. Right. So he he died. The only two that I've read and thus far that haven't seen or experienced death is Enoch and Elijah. So I kind of I tend to go towards them as being the two witnesses as well right me too moses and and elijah and the other thing if you look at it because e even in my studies um as i looked at moses and elijah both of them represented something moses brought the law mm -hmm. and elijah was the prophet right so, so you know I, I that's why i think it's going to be moses and elijah Okay. It's gonna be interesting. I don't think if we get to heaven, we're gonna be worried about it. I don't no. think so either. No. I think mm -hmm. we're gonna be happy. And to like be the there. one, I'd be glad to be there. Yeah. Praise God. I'll be happy. I'll be happy. Mm -hmm. That's right. I just That's wanna right. get <laughs> And like the one um, video I was uh, listening to, he says. This is all speculation because we won't know until it actually happens. Right, right. Because there's no, um, God doesn't tell us out now who they are. The only one we know for sure is Elijah. But as far as Enoch and Moses, those are the only two we don't know for sure. But the Antichrist will make war with the witnesses, will overcome them and kill them. But the thing is, is that anyone that comes up besides the Antichrist that tries to hurt them, they will be killed with fire from their mouths. Mm. Can you imagine trying to come up and bully them and all of a sudden fire comes from the mouth of a, a man and just consumes you? Mm. Wow. Now, is that literal fire? Oh, yes. I believe so. Mm. Yeah, I, oh, I, yes. I believe that's literal. Yeah. That's literal. Mm-hmm. Did it consume them? Yes. Yeah. And I also believe that we're being set up for that. If you look at a lot of your TV shows now with all these superheroes, everybody got powers. I'm I'm on Netflix and, and all. <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> it's like every um, superhero, they got, you know, superpower fist. I, I, and I, I'm very heroistic. So I'm watching it every night. There's all kinds of superheroes. You know, everybody's got power. So the world is going to be, it's not going to be strange for a man to do that because they've been watching all their life. Um, mm -hmm. and saying, what do they call it? They're, um, 
oh, I can't forget the, there's some, they're desensitizing us to it. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. So when it actually happens, we will be, it won't be something miraculous to us. It'll be something that's normal. Because we already know that they're already trying to make super soldiers. Mm -hmm. So they've been experimenting for years. So they're already desensitizing us by always presenting these types of life, these types of people before us. So when it actually happens, it won't be something miraculous to us. So they can discredit it. Right. Or make it now, easy. during that time, Jerusalem spiritually will become a Sodom and Egypt. Mm -hmm. They will be that corrupt spiritually they will be that corrupt now when the witnesses are killed mm -hmm. our technology today will be so that they will be viewed 24 7. they'll be they'll be viewed for three and a half days 24 hours a day mm. And the people will be so corrupt in their mind that they will be rejoicing over these people, these two men laying on the ground dead and sending each other gifts. Mm -hmm. And that's how far gone we'll, uh, that we're already at. Wow, 20 years ago, this wasn't possible. That's true. We have live streaming now. We have all these types of different kinds of technology that you can, even with your cell phone and with your cameras and all different kinds of computer stuff that you can stream live anything in from anywhere. Well, now I will say this because I used to work for Naval Undersea Warfare. Uh -huh. um, they had, during that time and oh wow this had to be about 25 to 27 years ago they already had phones um where they could call the different um uh, departments um department heads and um even talk with the president because what they did naval undersea warfare they um built torpedoes and things of that nature so they could see one another and that was technology at the time that wasn't available to everyday man that was only mm -hmm. something yeah. that our government and military had use of but um it has of course since then taken its turn and everybody has it now right now the resurrection go ahead it's the only time you see rejoicing on the earth and it's mm -hmm. perverted but rejoicing you don't see it anywhere else oh. right mm. And they'll be rejoicing, sending each other presents over it and everything. But the great thing is, is that there will be a resurrection of the two witnesses. Mm -hmm. Verse 11 says, and after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God enters into them and they stood upon their feet. And a great fear fell upon them, which saw them. So because it's being streamed live around the world, everyone that's watching will see this. So it's not like they can say, oh, this is not real. Y'all been watching it. Y'all been rejoicing over it, sending each other presents about it. But now you're going to see these men alive again and not only are you going to see them live again verse 12 and they come on go back go back oh wrong way and they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them come up hither and they ascended up to heaven in a cloud and their enemies beheld them so they're going to go up to heaven and these that are watching them are gonna see them do it. It's not like they're gonna, it's gonna be an instantaneous thing. They're gonna be able to see them ascending into heaven. Mm -hmm. 
So during this time, do you think there will be people that will um, call on on Jesus? There will be those that that will believe. Okay. But there will be those that are so perverted in their minds and in their spirit that this won't face them. I really think that this helps set up um, the Antichrist, that he is, uh, it's going to set up, help him set up his kingdom, that he's going to do something that nobody else could do, and that will destroy these two evil, these two evil men, and, uh, and so that's going to, you can imagine how the world's going to feel about him, because he was able to do something that nobody else could do. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because he has control over this world and at that time and he has control over the communication and everything he'll probably put a spin on it like it was something he did yeah yes it'll be yeah okay. yeah i can see Cause, that because look what trump's doing now you know <laughs> he puts a spin on everything that you know yeah i can that, see that that has benefit I can see that. I so, like it. Mm -hmm. The seventh trumpet, the kingdom proclaimed. Here John again resumes the sequential movement of the book. So the second world concludes in chapter nine. Is now mentioned as an introduction to the third and final world. Thus John says, behold, the third world comes quickly. In 813, John was informed that the last three trumpet judgments, they're called woes, would be more intense upon the earth dwellers. Now with 1114, we're told the third woe is coming and quickly. Mm -hmm. This is the seventh trumpet that will take us up to the return of Christ and the establishment of his kingdom. The picture here, verses 19, I mean 15 through 19, is a panoramic of the rest of the tribulation. The stress is on the efforts of the seventh trumpet. It ushers in the reign of Christ. This judgment becomes the greatest well because it includes the seven bold judgments, though they are not mentioned here. Um. And that's the end of chapter 11. It was, it was Go ahead. In that last sentence about um, Christ's reign, um, because he doesn't reign on earth, he reigns in us. But here it says, the stress is on the efforts of the, it is ushers in the reign of Christ. Um, it was interesting as I was reading that up until this point, Christ did not reign um, in the earth. Right. But here he begins his reign. I just, that just jumped out at me. You know, when you're a Christian, you think, well, Christ reigns, but we have a, you know, who's the ruler of this world, but that just jumped out at me. I was like, wow. Yes. Mm -hmm. That, that did jump out at me as well, too. And um, the more as we go into everything and as we learn the rest of, I can't wait to hear the rest of what y'all get out of Revelation because what comes and how it's unfolding is amazing. Mm -hmm. Now chapter 12 is very, is full of symbolisms. We start off with the first sign a great sign appears in heaven sign as used here and in verse three is the greek don't know how to pronounce it it's s h m e i o n um it refers to something like a special event an object or even a miracle that is seen and that stands as a, a sign or symbol designed to reveal some special meaning, truth, or idea. Um, the woman, a woman clothed with the sun 
<coughs> which represents the nation of Israel. She represents the nation of Israel. So every time you hear the woman mentioned in chapter 12, that's the nation of Israel they're talking about. This is evident for the following reason. Her description is remin um, reminiscing of Genesis 37, 9 through 12, where these heavenly bodies, the sun and the moon, represents Jacob and Rachel. This identifies the woman with Israel and the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant. Second, the 12 stars in her crown would link her to the 12 tribes of Israel or the 12 sons of Jacob, the patriarchs of Israel. In verse two, she is seen with a with child, one who rules with a rod of iron in verse five. This can be none other than Christ who as promised in scripture from was from the nation of Israel. Um, the scriptures associated with this um, text is Matthew's chapter one, verses one through five, cross-reference also Psalms, um, chapter one, verses one, eight through nine, and Revelations chapter two, verses 27, chapter 19, and verses 15. The, descript the description given here is merely, it's not merely to identify her because to describe her in queenly terms because of Israel's prominence in the plan of God and especially in the millennial reign of Christ. This identifies her with the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant, cross-reference Psalms 89, verse 34 through 37. The second sign, behold, a great red dragon. This great red dragon is Satan. Oops. Sorry about that. This great red dragon is Satan. And Satan, we remember, he took a third of the angels from heaven to earth with him when he got and tried to, you know, he wanted to be like God. He wanted to take over heaven, but he got kicked out of heaven. But we know in the Old Testament, when the sons of God used to go, that he would be there with them. So he still had access to heaven. Question, comment, or statement? Then we come to the woman in the wilderness. God has prepared a place. The woman fleeing into the wilderness takes us to the trials of Israel in the last half of the tribulation where she will be under great persecution for three and a half years. That's 1,265 days. And where she is, she'll be prepared it God prepared a place for, and she it will be taken well taken care of. Then we have the child. The child, definitely we know, is the man child, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Caught up to God and his throne, the ascension and the session prove the facts of the cross and resurrection, Hebrews 1, 13. This is the proof of Satan's failure and of Satan's sure defeat, cross-referenced Romans 16, 20. As Genesis 3, 14 and 15 anticipates Satan's bruised Christ's heel, the cross, but Christ crushed Satan's head by his death and resurrection, culminated by his ascension, cross-referenced Colossians 2, 15. Michael, he undoubtedly possessed great power and strength, here in Revelation 12, 7, we see Michael standing up to bring about another phase of Satan's defeat in this future time that Jeremiah called Jacob's distress, Jeremiah 35 through 7. All of this indicates that as chief prince, he has a special responsibility as guardian of Israel, especially during the tribulation.
Then we have another war in heaven. This time Satan gets thrown out and thrown out for good. So Satan is permanently kicked out from heaven and he decides that he's back on earth and he is going to take it out on the woman once and for all. And Satan has always tried to emulate God. So God cleansed the earth with a flood. What does he try to do? He tries to cleanse Israel out with a flood. Doesn't work. The earth opens up and swallows up the flood. So here he might call her to be carried away by a flood. Doesn't succeed. Question, comment, or statement? I'm good. So then the dragon was furious. This is verse 17. Enraged at the woman. And he went away to wage war on the remainder of her descendants, on those who obeys, excuse me, obey God's commandments and who have the testimony of Jesus Christ and adhere to it and bear witness to him. This verse serves to emphasize that the dragon will become totally frustrated and enraged over his inability to wipe out the woman, but he will become particularly angry with the believing remnant who will turn to Jesus Christ, believe the word and stand ready. Go back, oops. Go back and stand ready to die for their faith in the Savior. Question, comment, or statement? I'm good. And that's the end of mine. That was the end of chapter 12. Oh, for your references, please. Those are my references for chapter 12. You want to see the rest for the other ones? No, go back to that again, please. Just want to look at it a second. Okay. Okay, so Bible Gateway, you use that a lot. Um, Prophecy.org. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Ancient. Okay. Very good. Very good. Okay. All right. Very, very good. Uh, Ken, we can give you a hand of applause. That was <laughs> awesome. <laughs> thank you. Okay. So we do thank God for that 10 through 12. Um, and we do have a recorded for those that don't have recorded. Uh, Bishop Calls, we got the recording for you so you can catch the beginning of it. Um, and so um, I think I will need it as well because it. Yep. Okay, okay, I'll make okay, I'll make sure I send it to both of you guys tonight. Mm -hmm. I have to uh, download and all that good stuff, and I'll make sure I get it to you guys. I have to actually send it to YouTube and then send it to you guys. I believe that's how it's going to be done. So. Um, Okay, so that's it until next week. So who is up on next week? That would be me. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, so uh, we'll see uh, Elder Penny on next week. Everybody, God bless you. Awesome job, Pastor Wright. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Right, we'll see you guys on next week. Hey, God bless you. God uh, bless, bless you. Have, Have a blessed work. night. Amen. Good night, night, everyone. Good night. Let's close out the word of prayer first. Father, okay. Jesus, we thank you for your goodness and your kindness. We thank you for all that you've done and all that you're going to do. And God, as we close out in this prayer, but God, not your presence, God, allow us to continue to God to go forth and to grow in your knowledge and in your wisdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you and good night, everyone. Amen. 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 Good night. Thanks, you too. Good night.